Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA A Plus certification training course on optimizing printer and scanner performance. I'm your host, James Messer, and in this module, we're going to step through the A Plus certification requirements from Test 220 601, our essentials exam. And in Section 4 2, it tells us that we need to optimize printer performance. We need to know about tray switching, print spool settings, device calibration, media types, and paper orientation. And from our 220-602 exam, section 4.2, we also need to optimize the performance as it relates to resolution, file format, and default settings. So there's quite a bit we're going to step through in this particular module. And what we'll start with is optimization and learning about what all of those settings are and where we can expect to find them inside of our printers and our scanners. Inside the scanner optimization, we'll talk about resolution, file format, and the default settings that we can have. So when we're done with this, we should know everything there is to know about optimizing our printer configuration and our scanners. Let's start with printers. And we'll step through this idea of switching between trays. You may recall from a previous module, I showed you some of these properties for an HP LaserJet 8150. And this printer has all of these trays that we showed, a tray 1, a tray 2, a tray 3, tray 4. So what I did was put side by side these properties that we have for our printer driver with the actual printer. This is an HP LaserJet 8150. And look at all of these different trays that it has inside of there, tray 1, tray 2, tray 3, tray 4, and tray 5. So that's exactly where this corresponds. So if you're ready to start printing something out, one of the options that you have inside of your application is where do you want the paper to come from? And so the ability to switch between trays is really important because you may have regular old draft paper in tray number one, but your letterhead may be in tray number two. So it depends on what you're printing out and how you want to print to exactly which tray you're going to print to. And you should see that all in your drivers. If you don't see that listed in your drivers, you may be using an older driver or you may be using the wrong driver for the printer you happen to be printing to. So make sure that those two things are syncing up with what you see inside of your driver and the type of printer you're printing to. We also have inside of our printer driver settings for our print spooler. A print spool is something inside of your Windows desktop and in your operating system that allows you to continue working after you've decided to print. What happens is that when you print, it doesn't go to the printer immediately. Everything is stored in a file that's on your system. And there's a separate process called a spooler that then takes that information off of that file and slowly sends it to the printer. And in the meantime, you can go do other things. Before there were print spoolers in the old DOS days, you had to sit, hit the print button and then you had to wait while that printout uh, finally finished. And when the printout was done, you could then resume whatever you were doing. So this print spooler became very efficient and effective to use in a Windows environment. But you have some control over it. For instance, in your laser printer properties, your printer properties of anything you happen to be using, your driver is set up so that you can either spool the print documents right then so that it finishes printing. But you also have the option to do it the old way, to print directly to the printer. If you're trying to do some troubleshooting to see if your spooler isn't working properly, you can always choose to print directly to the printer and see if the problem happens to be with that spooler service that's in your Windows environment. We'll look at that in a troubleshooting module later on. Now you have the option for printing so that you can start printing after you've finally spooled everything to the hard drive, or you can just start printing immediately. So you can send information to the spooler, and the spooler begins printing it out to the printer as soon as it gets it. Now if you have a very slow computer or slow network connection to that printer, you may choose that you want to start printing after the last page is spooled. This means it's going to take a while as it writes things to the hard drive, but afterwards everything's freed up from that process and then it can concentrate just on sending information off to the printer. You've also got some options down a little bit lower where you can hold documents that are mismatched. You can print everything that's spooled first and all the non-spooled documents later. Maybe keep the printed documents on your hard drive so that if you want to re-spool them again, send them back out to the printer, they'd be there. And there's a number of advanced printing features for your printer that will be specified in your driver. We saw some of those with the trays that we had there. You may want to make sure that those advanced printing features are turned on. The only time you'd ever want to turn those off is if you were troubleshooting something with your printer. So very often you'll see those always check marked on in your printer driver. We mentioned in our module on installing printers that we needed to calibrate the printer once we had it in place. And that was important because we wanted to be sure the colors were matching what we had on our screen with what was printing out on the printer. 
Now, this meant that usually you need a screen that was optimized for the color type that you're using. But you'll see that there is, and especially in color printers, a color management setting that's in that printer driver and the properties of that printer so that you can associate the color profile that you've set up for your screen with what you're doing on your printer. This is also going to change depending on the type of paper that you're printing to. And very often, your print driver is configured so that it knows the type of paper you're printing to. You've told it the type of paper, and it will make adjustments for you because it knows the color profile that you're using. So the process usually is that we're looking at the image that's on our monitor, and we're trying to print it out so that it matches exactly what we're doing. Now you also want to do this with scanners. You may want to scan something in and see that your scanner is properly coloring in so that on your screen it matches what you've just scanned. So this may be a process you go through a couple of times with both your printer and your scanner to get it just right. In environments where you're working a lot with printed materials, with graphic type environments, and you're creating some output that will be sent somewhere else, this becomes extremely important. If this is a normal work environment where you're just printing out a number of reports, you may never get to the point where you want to calibrate colors. But it's important to know that it's in there and where those color management settings are. When working with your printers and scanners, you also want to tell the printer or scanner the type of paper that you're using. You may be printing to plain paper, to a matte type paper, or to a glossy paper. And each one of those papers is going to absorb ink or toner in different ways. So by telling your print driver the type of paper you're using, you're going to optimize how your printout is going to look. So this is not only the saturation that we're using, but the drying capabilities and even the brightness of the paper becomes important when we're trying to match up the colors to what's going on. What you'll find is depending on the paper type you're using on an inkjet printer, it may print out one page and it may intentionally wait before printing the second page because it's giving that paper time to dry. It knows that we put a certain amount of ink on the paper and that we're using a certain type of paper and it knows exactly how long to wait before ever laying another piece of paper on top of it. Another important piece inside of our configuration of our print driver is the orientation. I printed out here the print screen that's on my browser. So we can see that the orientation for portrait is the kind where the paper is facing straight up and down. Landscape, it even has a little picture here of the icon for landscape, is where the page is turned on its side. And depending on what you're printing out, you may want to have it in portrait mode or you may want to have it in landscape mode. And it's when you're printing and you choose to print where you have the option to tell the printer what way you would like this printout to go. And it may pull the paper from a different tray or it may simply change change the way that it prints to print it on the same piece of paper. But either way, you're telling the printer exactly the way you'd like this printout to come out. Scanner optimization is also important. When we've plugged in our scanner, one of the things that becomes extremely important is the resolution that we're using. And this is measured in something called dots per inch. And it's exactly what it sounds like. We want to be sure we have a certain number of dots that we're measuring for every inch on our scanner. The first commercial laser printers were 300 dots per inch. So that's a very, very precise, very small amount of dots that we have there. So we get very, very fine and very graphically rich output from those first laser printers. That's why they become so valuable in corporate environments, because the printouts looked so good. So 300 dots per inch is what most people think about when they're looking at laser printed output. When you go into your printer settings and you're ready to print something out, most often the colors that you do are going to be at least 300 dots per inch or higher. And that's really high resolution. You've got some graphics and some printout, some print, some really pictures that you want to print out with that. There's also a setting on your printer you may have seen or your scanner you may have seen for grayscale. You want to scan something in and you want to have different levels of gray but you don't want it to be in color. Just take what's in color and give us different levels. So this may be 256 shades. It may be 16 million shades of gray. But it is also at a very high dots per inch because it usually is also very graphical. And sometimes you want to take a single uh, receipt or a piece of paper and only scan it in with the color black or the color white. This is usually when you're archiving documents off. You're doing an expense report. You're saving a, a report or a sheet of paper or a contract for later. You may only want this to be in black and white. And usually you're doing this to 100 or 200 dots per inch or even smaller, depending on how much you want to be able to see of that once it's scanned in. Finally, you want to set the color depth. 
for an 8-bit or 16-bit or 32-bit color depth, you want to see how many different shades are going to be available or how many different levels of color are going to be available when you begin that scanning process. And these days, the obviously, the 8 bits and the 32-bit of a scan at exactly the same dots per inch is going to vary greatly. The 8-bit color depth is going to be a much smaller file than the 32-bit color depth. So although it looks a lot better at 32 bits, you're using up a lot more disk space. So something you have to keep in mind when you're doing some of these larger scans. When you're working with graphics, especially on a scanner, you're going to run into your scanner software that's going to ask you to save the file. And it's going to ask you to do it in many different file types available to you. And you may wonder which file type is the appropriate one to use. So I wanted to step through a few of those. One that's very common, especially in Windows, is something called a device independent bitmap or a BMP file. This is usually an uncompressed file, so it tends to be very large. But because you're not compressing it in any way, you can be assured that that image, when it finally is pulled back up again from disk, is going to look exactly as it was prior to you saving it. Now there's also a format that is something called a lossy compression, which means it compresses it. But when it uncompresses it, you don't get the same resolution back that you had in that original picture. It can come really close, but it's not the same as that initial scan. And that's something that one of these types is called a JPEG type, JPG or JPEG, which stands for Joint Photographic Experts Group. And this was created by a group of people who are very interested in saving disk space for photographs. And so you'll find that it's a great compression type. It's used a lot on the internet. Another type of format is something called a GIF, G-I-F, or Graphics Interchange Format. This is a compressed type, but we aren't losing anything in the compression. The difference here is that the total number of colors available to the palette of what we're saving is only 256 colors. So this is not great for photographs, but it does save a lot of room when you're saving it to disk. And this is used for very small images, for buttons that are on your screen, for arrows, but not really great when you're working with photographs. For people that are doing a lot of desktop publishing, you'll see that they're very familiar with a format called Tagged Image File Format, or a TIFF format. This is compressing the file, but this is also a lossless compression, which means when we pull it back off disk, it's exactly the way we left it when we saved it the first time. You see this a lot in desktop publishing. The, uh, the uh, format itself hasn't been updated in a number of years. And so it's slowly fading by the wayside. But if you happen to have some very old files that you've saved, it's nice to have a program that's able to launch those files, open them up in the graphics format, and even save them off to some of those older pieces of software. Finally, there's a format called PNG. This is one of the newest file formats you'll see called Portable Network Graphics. This is also a compression type that's lossless, which means we don't lose anything when we save this file. It was really designed to be a replacement for GIF because it's able to save it a much larger color palette. And because of that, it's also taking the place of GIF and in some cases JPEG on the internet. So you'll see a number of websites using a PNG format for all of the graphics that are out there on that site. The way that you configure the default settings for a printer or for a scanner can be very, very important over a long period of time, especially if this printer or scanner is used a lot in an enterprise. This is something that you're usually configuring on the device itself. So you're going to the control panel of the printer or the control panel of the scanner, and you're telling it all of the settings that you'd want it to use if you didn't tell it anything. You just sent some text to it. How is it going to take that text and print it? Is it going to be in draft mode? Is it going to be in high resolution mode? Is it going to print in color by default? Or is it going to print in black and white by default? What is this, the settings you're going to have on that scanner? And so this is the settings and the defaults that are going to be on there. You want to set perhaps the type of paper that you happen to be using, maybe the scanning resolution. So every time you put a piece of paper, you hit a scan button on the scanner, what's the resolution that's going to use? A higher resolution is going to use more disk space. A lower resolution is going to give you an output that may not have the quality you're expecting. So you want to be sure to set those default settings for the environment that this will normally be used when you're scanning or you're printing. And as I mentioned, you may want to choose whether you want to use color or whether you want to use black and white for this color or this scanner. Uh, this printer, if, if the printer is one that's using color, then you're going to go through that color a lot faster. And what you're going to find is whether it's a color laser or a color inkjet, color is very expensive. So maybe it makes sense in your environment to set the default up to be black and white. And if somebody wants to turn on color in their print process, that's the only time you'll use color. So it's important to keep those default settings in mind. 
In review, we've stepped through printer optimization. We've understand now about how the trays work, how the spool settings are configured, how to calibrate the device, and how those different media types and the orientation of the paper are used. We've also gone through scanner optimization and how the resolution is important. We've stepped through a number of file formats, and we've discussed how the default settings on those printer and scanners are extremely important. For more A-plus videos, to participate in our message boards, and much more, you can visit our website, freeaplus.com.